Well, welcome back. I'm going to begin with some very good news. There is really, really exciting news in the area of addiction recovery. Presently, right now, in 2014, there are more men recovering from pornography addiction. According to one estimate, there are more recovering from pornography addiction than there are new pornography addicts in among the male population. Now that is exciting. 2014, presently, we are on the march as a people saying we've had enough of this thing. Let's have some real solutions. Let's move forward. These last two sessions are going to be very practical. We're talking about a how-to. This session, behold, I will do a new thing, the Lord says. And I'm going to begin, of course, with prayer, but then bring in some, some even some hope in, in secular circles that they are saying from science and just regular people able to govern themselves in this regard. And you're going to amplify that a hundred times when you see what God can do in your life. So let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another opportunity to explore your plan for victory, your design that you have for each one of us to move forward in newness of life. Lord, we, we want to behold that you will do a new thing. We want to see that the old has gone and the new has come. And we pray for your spirit to not only speak through me, but speak to each individual to convict, to guide, and to give us the exact path that each one needs to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a study done at UCLA very recently. And in this study, they had a group of men, two, diff two different groups of individuals. The first group, they primed them by having them talk about their most exciting sexual fantasies. This is not a study that I would want to conduct, but interestingly, after they had these men talk about all of their sexual lusts, they had them do certain activities. And then they had another group talk about their love for their spouse, their commitment, their, the, how they fell in love, all of these kinds of things. The study wanted to discover, can feelings of love overcome feelings of lust in their terminology? Now what they had these gentlemen do is the first group, after talking about sexual lust, they were to click through a bunch of photos, a bunch of photos of women. And then the other guys were to do the same with the exact same photos. Now they told them, okay gentlemen, rank these in terms of attractiveness. And so the men were supposed to click through, look at the image for a little while, and then rank it in terms of attractiveness. Now that whole exercise was actually just a ruse. What they really wanted to identify, but they couldn't tell the men this, they really wanted to identify how long these individuals would hold their gaze on a particularly sexually alluring photograph that was inserted into the lineup as they're clicking through. And what they discovered was that the men who had been primed with sexual lust spent longer time than the men who had not, who had, who had been talking about their love for their spouse and their commitment to their spouse. You know what they did? This is a secular study. When the sexy picture came up, they clicked through it really fast. They, 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 they wanted to avert their eyes from it. Isn't that amazing? Here we now have a scientific study saying that if you're focused on commitment, intimacy, true intimacy, love with your spouse, then that can discard lust from your life. That result is really powerful. So men who had been dwelling upon their love for their wives quickly skipped over the most sexy photos. That is encouraging to me. How much more then for us who are believers in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, you can overcome lust. And this is true even for single people. You might say, well, I don't have a wife to dwell upon here. How would this work for me? What is the most intimate relationship in the universe? between human beings. So who, who can we have the closest fellowship with other than God? And so whether you're single, married, it doesn't matter. Contemplating Christ, I promise you, if they were to do a study and have, have a group that was thinking about their commitment to Christ, we would be skipping through those photos very quickly too. And so we're talking about recovery here. I want to start with a very, very serious disclaimer. And that is, when, when we look at the addiction recovery movement, there is a lot of talk about something that I think has been amplified and built up too much, frankly. And that is, they have a false God. They're in danger of having a false God, and that false God is man, meaning having recovery groups. And this is the people that I look to for my solution in overcoming an addiction. Now, there, it is good to walk with brethren, right? And, and a three-fold cord is not easily broken. And, you know, if one falls down, the other can pick him up, this sort of thing. But 
if we are looking to man as the solution, Jesus says, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Don't hang your hopes. Don't look to men. Look to Jesus constantly. Now, having said that, let's look at Enoch here. It says, if you, can, if you expect all your counsel and wisdom to come from men, mortal and finite like yourself, you will receive only human help. If you go to God for help and wisdom, he will never disappoint your faith. Now, it is true that I think we could afford to have a dose of openness when it comes to discussing sexuality. But we should not be publicly proclaiming all of our sexual sins before everybody. It's not going to be helpful. Now, having said that, I do believe the Bible says that in the multitude of counsel is great wisdom. So if we believe in the multitude of counsel is great wisdom, then we may go to counsel, human counsel, to find insights, to gain understanding, to seek some guidance. Listen to this statement from Mind, Character, and Personality. It says, the inexperienced need to be guided with wise counsel when in trial and assailed with temptation. So ask yourself, are you, have you overcome lust? Are you inexperienced in overcoming or are you experienced in overcoming? I'd say most are inexperienced. We have not overcome lust. So it says, the quotation said, the inexperienced need counsel. They need guidance from a fellow man in addition to God. And this is why Jesus has called us to bear each other's burdens, to walk together in this Christian life. Now, if you don't have experience in overcoming lust, seek somebody. Seek somebody who's a little further along in that spiritual journey, somebody whose opinion you respect, that you can look to as a mentor, not to replace Christ, not to now say, this is going to be where I put all my cards and all my eggs in this basket, but Find somebody who, who, who you can talk to about some of these things. Hey folks, if you're enjoying the program, open up another tab and head over to beltoftruth.tv. You'll see all of our other seminars and topics there from parenting seminars, breaking free from the social control of the power elite through the worldly media and schooling agendas, American history, the history of the pilgrims, history of abortion, overcoming media addictions, bunch of practical topics. And those who believe in our message and want to support the work we are doing, please consider subscribing there. It's free for the asking for those who can't afford the $7 a month, but subscribe at beltoftruth.tv for all of our content. And I'll tell you right out of the gates that Belt of Truth Ministries is not equipped to handle uh, a lot of these, these needs because there are, there are thousands and thousands of, of, of men in, in this same boat. Um, Scott Ritzma is, doesn't have any experience in, in counseling or overcoming pornography addiction for that matter. Uh, everything that I have to offer you is coming through in this seminar, but I, I do recommend that you find somebody to talk to if you're of that description, inexperienced, and you're needing the counsel and guidance of somebody else. Pornography addiction is already the number one reason why men in the church today are seeking professional counseling. That is one option to find a professional Christian counselor in your area. Uh, somebody whose religious perspective that you can validate and affirm. I actually, just to, for the purpose of this seminar, just to see what's out there, I contacted a number of Christian counselors through the American Association of Christian Counselors. And I asked them, uh, first of all, uh, do, you, do you deal with pornography addiction counseling? And then secondly, would you allow somebody to ask you some questions, to interview you, to get on the phone with you before signing up for a session? And they said yes, almost all of them said yes and yes. And you do want to ask them some tough questions because if they're coming from a different point of view than a sound biblical approach, just because they're a member of an organization does not mean anything. These people are not infallible, so they do not replace Christ. And so if you do go that route, out, only listen to what they're saying if what they are saying is coming from Christ, right? And, and they, they ought to be pointing you to Jesus. And if they're not, then that's not where we need to be going for, for help. Uh, it could be just somebody in the church. It could just be somebody who you respect. And, and by the way, this statement says, unless you are wrought upon by the Holy Spirit in a special manner to confess your sins of private, of private nature to man, do not breathe them 
to any soul. Now, a lot of people have misinterpreted this as if we have to be completely struggling with things on our own. We can't walk with a fellow male friend and say, hey, how can we do this life better? How can we glorify God better and win souls and purify our lives better? No, you're not supposed to walk the Christian life alone. But you notice the statement said, don't breathe the secret sins into other, other people's ears. So as you're seeking out somebody else, as, as somebody who can give you some some tips, some guidance. Don't be unveiling all of the secret sins in your life. Don't go to that priestly confessional booth and feel that you have to bear your soul. But if you go to somebody and you say, hey, you know, I'm, I, 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 I want to I wanna have a, a more healthy relationship with my eyes in terms of uh, the lust issue. And, you know, you're not laying bare all your, your secret private sins, but you say, hey, could you give me some pointers on how you have dealt with this? This kind of open conversation is not what we read about in a statement like that, where it says, don't breathe your sins into another ear. This means the private nature of, of all of the, the, the gory, gruesome details of what you've been into. Confess that to God and say, you know, just between you and God. Because if we're not talking to anybody, if we're not saying, hey, how can, I, how can I walk with the Lord better? We have no friendships like this. You know what? We're isolated. And pornography is terribly isolating. God's plan, remember, is for intimacy, to love God, to have relationships with our fellow man. So if you're trying to walk life's journey alone, it's destined for failure. You need help of some kind, some sort of accountability, some sort of mentor. But don't dive into this whole movement of we're just going to sit around and talk about our addiction all day and just bear all of our detailed experiences with, with man not talking to God about it. That can be a danger as well. So do you confess to your wife, men asked. In fact, many of them, when they get fired up about tackling this lust issue, they say, all right, I'm going to dive right in and just, just take the bull by the horns and get this thing done. And they go straight to their wife and they tell her everything or nearly everything or some things right away before they have taken steps in the process of victory. Now, here's the thing. If you haven't been caught yet and you're still of the mindset that, you know what, this is a secret thing and I, you know what, nobody knows about it. Well, nobody knows about it. That just means other human beings don't know about it. The whole heavenly universe already knows about it. And at the second coming, at the great white throne judgment, uh, during the millennium, all, all of our lives are going to be laid bare. So there's not a soul in the universe who won't know about it. So it's not something that is secret or will be kept secret. So... We do need to move forward with, with confession to those whom we have wronged, but how to do this is the question. Please, please listen carefully on this. This is a big, big disclaimer. We don't want to go forward foolishly on this. So be sure not to do the following. The first one, don't get into all the lurid details with the wife who you've committed adultery on through the pornographic world. That's not going to be helpful. It's unnecessary. You don't need to go there ever. It's just going to unnecess unnecessarily traumatize her, okay? And really, it's gonna make recovery harder for, for the both of you, it, the, the more traumatic things get. Secondly, don't give your wife a staggered disclosure is what it's called. Staggered disclosure, where you give her bits of information over time. So you, you tell her a little bit now and then a little bit later and then, oh yeah, I did this and, and I should tell you about that other thing I did and this and this and this or and then I slipped into it and I did it again, did it again. Over time, this is actually how 85% of men disclose these infidelities to their wives. In a clinical study, women who had experienced this sort of disclosure had the emotional profile of a rape victim. So it's really going to be hard for her if you do it that way. After you're well in the recovery process, how do you go about saying, I, I, I committed adultery on, on you? Uh, how do you go about confessing this to your wife and opening up the sins that you have committed against her? Uh, first of all, you've done this to God first. Um, but if to, to repair that relationship, to the grow that relationship. Number one, be completely vulnerable with her. Tell her your story, meaning start from childhood and, and on from there and begin with those wounds that you have in your life. Tell her 
things that you have never told her before about your pain, about your insecurities, about your fears. But also you take responsibility for your actions. If you only do step one there, it's going to come off like, and it might actually be you trying to make excuses, right? But it's not an excuse, it's an explanation for how you got to the point where you did make these decisions that were terribly toxic and, and, and harmful. And you take responsibility for those decisions. Explaining this past doesn't excuse it. But the third thing, explain the steps that you've already taken in recovery. Show her that you are 110% committed to recovery. Chances are she's already noticed a new you and this will be something that is welcomed and can move forward in a positive and healthy manner. Now, have I given you an exhaustive way of viewing this? No, these are a few tips. So this is something that, that requires deeper understanding and, and, and search this out, study this out, talk to a good counselor about this, understand the psychology psychology of women with this. We're not even barely, we just touched on that for a couple of slides. There should be a whole seminar on how women deal with pornography recovery of their husbands because this is adultery and it is something that is very traumatic for them. And so the few minutes I've spent on it don't suffice. So dig deeper into that. But right now let's talk about you again. Breaking the chains of addiction. How are we going to move forward with complete recovery, complete healing, having a fresh new start? And I I mean a radical break. You're probably going to be surprised by some of the things I might be recommending you in the next sessions, but consider it. The Bible says something very strong about how we move forward. In Isaiah 43, 18 to 19, we read, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? And I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Did you notice? Do not remember the former things. Do not remember the things of old. Do not think of them. Behold, I do a new thing. This is what God's going to do in your life, a completely new thing. It's the old thoughts, the old patterns, the old life, the old, the old, the old that has got to go. Forgetting the old, committing to a radically different new alternative, a whole different way of doing life. We are going to change from doing life this way to doing life this way. Addiction recovery is not a modification of my life. It's not the same life minus the addiction and then I move forward. No, it's got to be a radical break. Don't think of addiction recovery as the process of stopping something. Think of it as rerouting into a whole new life. You've been going down that highway every time as we talked about earlier in the seminar, right? We want a whole new pathway, a whole new life. This is a radical, radical break and it's for the long term. Sex addiction counselors have, have, have identified that typically we're looking at a two to five year period of time of seeking healing for this where you're going to have a miracle every day. There are relapses very common in the first months and year. This is not going to change overnight. Those old pathways did not take one day to form, right? Those channels were formed over a long period of time and so they're not going to be rerouted and forming new pathways overnight either. And so we need structural changes in the brain. This is going to take some time. And I'll tell you something you're going to look different. The way life goes, when you radically restructure your life and do things radically different, it's, people are going to notice. So don't at this point go, oh no, people are going to think I've gone nuts. I'm, I'm, I'm weird now on my diet. And we're going to talk about diet. We're going to talk about all these things. Don't worry about what people are going to think. Think about Enoch. Enoch, here was the way Enoch walked with God. Enoch was not concerned about what other people thought. Let's read this. Here was the way Enoch walked with God. And when light shone upon his path, he did not expect to say, why, what will my friends and relatives say of me if I take this course? No, he did that which was right, whatever the consequences. We need to be Enoch's. We need to say, I'm going to do something radical if that's what it takes in order to move forward in healing. And if people think I'm weird because of what I'm doing, whatever. That, I don't care about those consequences. And so once... We take these steps. We go down this road. 
what are the steps that we are taking? The first thing we need to do is we need to seek emotional healing. Chances are, as we talked about earlier in the seminar, you've got some, some wounds from childhood. Finding those wounds is not about making excuses. It, it's finding them so we can pull them up, right? And it, it, by the way, if you're just ruminating over this, oh, you know, I'm so oppressed and these terrible things happen in my life, just continually thinking about it is not going to be good either because then we just enter into self-pity and a victim mindset and it's be clouding our vision for moving forward. So stay positive. In, in fact, speaking about staying positive, positive, the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times, right? And not just that, but we find that actually in the, in the research, in the science, positive thoughts are associated with greater frontal lobe activity. It's going to strengthen your neurological ability to overcome. Even just by changing the expression on your face from a frown to a smile, you know what that does? It changes mood and brain chemistry. Isn't that amazing? Positive thinking and speaking is a habit. You have to make a choice to dwell on the positive, to have gratitude in your life like the Bible tells us to. And this, by the way, this in and of itself is not the great end all and solution of life. It's just think positive and everything will be good. But without positive thinking, if I'm cynical and negative and critical and gloomy all the time, it's going to be very harmful. There's so much to celebrate in life, right? God wants us to pray with thanksgiving in our hearts. He says, with thanksgiving, present your request to the Lord. So do we have thanksgiving in our hearts? Are we being grateful? Do we appreciate the daily gifts that we are given by God? What you see here from the research is that gratitude, optimism, diligence, and perseverance, notice gratitude and optimism under stress are all linked to better mental health and better physical health. So you are going to be a more healthy person mentally and physically, brain and body, if you have more gratitude, more optimi optimism. But back to those wounds. We do need to seek emotional healing. Rather than denying our pain and just living with it, we're going to move forward and be healed. And so the first thing, lack of childhood affirmation. Remember, we didn't get that encouragement. I love that word. We, weren't, we didn't become courageous people because we didn't get that for what we needed at the youngest ages. And I'll tell you, most of us guys have very fragile egos, right? We have Jesus here. Jesus was never elated by applause or dejected by censure. That is something that's so far beyond most people. How could you not be elated by applause and dejected by censure? Jesus had experienced something different than us. He didn't live with chronic fear and insecurity of, of, of not measuring up. He, 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 didn't, he didn't have this thing where he was puffed up easily or torn down easily. What was the difference between Jesus' experience and ours? What did his father say about him? Twice in the Gospels, at his baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration, he said the same thing to his son. He said, this is my son whom I love and whom I am well pleased. Maybe you didn't hear that enough as a kid. Maybe you don't feel well loved. Maybe you weren't respected, built up, encouraged. And I don't mean had your ego petted. I don't mean been, had been puffed up with pride. I mean encouraged. You were given courage by being able to accomplish tasks and having people saying you can do it and believing in you and saying I love you no matter what happens. I love you. I love you. I love you. You are my beloved son whom I am well pleased. Now, if we didn't hear that enough, that, that, that's going to be a wound that we have as a kid. You know, that much have, has been discussed about the so-called father wound that many guys and gals walk around with in their adult lives. Here we have these deep emotional wounds from when we were children, from, from our fathers either not giving us what we need or, or, or just even being directly wounded in, in some way, which many people are really dealing with even deeper pain. But for more people, it's a neglect wound rather than a direct wound, if you will. Father not being there. How do we heal that? Well, have you ever wondered why Jesus asked us to pray to God by calling him Father? We are supposed to say, our Father. Jesus, in Hebrews, remember, is our brother. Our Father is Jesus' Father. And so we're supposed to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Why our Father? God wants to heal that father wound in your heart. He wants to be your perfect father to replace what it is that you did not get. You know, if you go back and you find that wound, if you're wondering, what is it? 
You know, what, what, where do I get pain from that maybe I'm not even aware of and I'm living out subconsciously with these fears and insecurities? If you're wondering about that, go, go in your mind back to and name the, the 10 worst experiences of your life or just five. Chances are there's some sort of wound there and chances are it's probably something from childhood. Something that has formed your identity, your sense of worth, your, your fear of failure. And you know what the devil has done? Right in that moment of pain, he has inserted a little, a little lie, a lie about yourself. And we got to replace that with the truth. So when we go to our father in heaven, he wants to replace the absent father or the wounding father or the imperfect father. And this is not meant to be a slam on fathers, right? I, I'm a father and I know I'm not doing it perfectly. So this is not meant to heap guilt upon you if you're a father. But God is the perfect father and none of us are. And you know what he'll do? Go back into that story. Go back into those occurrences of pain and wounds. God can be in that situation in your mind's eye. What would he have done? How does he feel about you? Does he affirm you? Is he there for you? Yes, yes, and yes. You know, many of us have this false picture of God, like he's some sort of distant, aloof, angry, vengeful being just sending lightning bolts down at us and condemning us, and you messed up again, you sinner and failure. No, that's not the picture of God that we see in Jesus. 75% of Americans actually have a, have a tyrannical, angry, vengeful conception of God's character. You know what happens in your heart if that's your view of God? You become rigid, judgmental, and addicted. You become this, this not very nice person. And I'll tell you, I am the biggest proponent I know of having a biblical worldview and high standards. People think I'm obnoxious with, with that sort of thing. So don't say, oh boy, he's gone off on some, some liberal tangent of feel-good Christianity. No, no, no. Christianity can be hard. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But there are promises of the ever-present loving Father. One of my favorite books called Patriarchs and Prophets begins with the words, God is love. And then another one of my favorite books called The Great Controversy ends with the words, God is love. This is the truth of God's character. And it's not separated from a true biblically based Christianity. They are one and the same. We have to find a way to combine these. Satan wants to lie to you about who God is. He, he, and God wants to retell that story. Find that little lie in your life that's forming who you are. Replace it with the truth of God's feelings about you. He's not standing over you as it's looking to condemn and destroy the sinner. He wants to heal. He came to seek and save that which is lost. Now, of course, it's true that many who do not accept that will be destroyed in the end. But that's not God lashing out and finally saying, yes, I'm going to hurt people. No, this is God's strange act. This is not his character. He's been, he's been mischaracterized in this great controversy. These accusations that the devil made against God were aimed right at his character in government. Now, this experience of going back to our Father and receiving the affirmation, receiving the encouragement, knowing that he's with us, this is not a one-time exercise. This is daily. Every day, I've got to get on my knees before God. I've got to humbly come before him and say, I need you. And, and I'll tell you something, just believing this, just, just intellectually knowing that God is love is not, not going to be enough, right? Because then here I go in my life and I completely deny many of the things that I so-called believe. Think about this, if you're viewing pornography, are you at that moment truly believing in or are you disbelieving in the omnipresence of God? I believe theoretically that God is everywhere, but then when I'm there doing this, I'm not thinking about that he's everywhere, am I? I'm not thinking about that he's got his hand on my shoulder saying, I've got a better way for you, son. Don't do this. Don't destroy yourself. Don't hurt yourself like this. Don't sin and offend and, 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 and mischaracterize me before the onlooking universe. If we truly believe that God is omnipresent and he has this character of reaching out to us, then our behavior would change. So we've got to correct our true belief, believe it at the heart level. And that requires spending the time contemplating these things, thinking about these things in true great depth. So if I ever feel worthless, you know, I may know that God is love. I may believe that God is love, but do I at the heart level? No, the Bible says that he has not given us a spirit of bondage again to fear. But we can cry out, Abba, Father, that we have been adopted by him. Every day I can come before him and say, thank you, Father, for telling me that I am your beloved son too. And that you're well pleased in the growth that you are working out in my life. 
This is not to boost up me and self. It only, I must humble myself in order to receive this and be lifted up by him. The second stage of emotional healing here is part of the healing process is starting to form social bonds, growing good, close friendships, brothers, friends, brothers in Christ, mentors, this kind of thing, people we can look up to and look to and just have a relationship with. Remember that addictions, especially pornography addiction, is terribly isolating. So if I'm sitting here alone, it's not going to work. I can't move forward that way because I'm just living within the same patterns I've been living. I have to get, you got to get out of that cocoon. Spread those wings and fly. And I know this is, takes risk and it's uncomfortable. And I don't really, this isn't who I am. It's got to be. Uh, you know, the, the, you probably don't have very close relationships uh, today if you're struggling with the pornography issue. The profile of the pornography user is a highly introverted in individual or isolated individual. Even if they're extroverted when they're with people, they have these very private, private places in life. Well, start to form those bonds. Don't be in your little cocoon so much and that will help. And remember, if you're intimacy starved, an intimacy starved man will bite at the first thing that poses as intimacy. And, and so form these relationships and that won't be nearly as big of a problem. And it's going to give you greater brain activity too. Take a look at this. Oxytocin releases in the, in the brain, in the body, actually increase brain activity versus those who are not having these oxytocin releases. So you see greater activity on the top row of brain images than the bottom. Oxytocin, remember, is the trust and bonding hormone where, where you're having a real connection with people. Most of all, by the way, if you're married, Court your wife. Start again and say, I'm really going to make this thing right and I'm going to love her like she deserves to be loved because she's my father in heaven's daughter, right? I mean, God's your father, but he's also your father-in-law and you want to treat his daughter right. Not, and here we also see numerous studies have linked a positive social life and volunteering with a bunch of things. If you have a positive social life, you're getting out of your shell, volunteering, blessing others, you're going to have improved mental health, less sickness, less depression, higher levels of optimism, and a longer life. These are all things that are going to help us overcome. Less depression, less sickness, greater mental health. All of these are essential as we move forward in healing. The mental health, the physical health, all of the, and more optimism. This is all going to be very helpful. A third stage of emotional healing that we want to go through is that we want to have a new identity in Christ. No more shame. Recovering from shame is very important. The Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit comes to you and tells you in John 3, 16, he's called the Spirit of Truth. Here's what he says to you, that you have a new name in heaven written on a white stone, that we, you have hope, you, you have true hope as an anchor for the soul, that God's love for you is even for sinners. That the strength we have from Jesus Christ will come. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That we will not be tempted beyond what we can bear, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That he will provide a way out. That you will hear a voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. This is what he says about you. But the devil will tell you, you're not going to make it. You're going to just do it again. You lust it anyway. You might as well go all the way down this lust cascade. There's no getting off that, on, on, off that, that highway. You're a failure. You have no control. So... What do you do? You, you, you don't listen to this accuser. You don't listen to this liar, the father of lies. You claim God's promises about yourself back to him. And here they are. I have called you by your name, God says. Thou art mine. I have rejoiced over you with singing, God says. Zephaniah 3.17. You are my beloved son whom I, in whom I am well pleased. He says that about all of his children. He loves every single one of us. So the first thing in the morning, you're claiming these promises about, your, about God's promises about you and your relationship with him. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen as one being taught, it says in Isaiah 50 verse 4. Start with those promises. When you go to prayer, you have something to be thankful for then. We're supposed to pray with thanksgiving in our hearts, right? Start with the promises, then go into prayer. God, thank you for these. Thank you for actualizing these promises in my life in a very real way. And then you know that the victory is yours. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Thank you, Jesus, for walking in new life with me so that I can have this intimacy with you and no more isolation in the, in the pornography world. I don't need shame because I know you affirm. I know you forgive. I know we're moving forward and my guilt is, is released from my shoulders and you've placed on me a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. And you need a good thoughtful hour to do this. 
You can't go into battle each day without the armor of God on. This is where you get the armor of God, right? There's a bunch of pieces in the armor of God. Some of them that are especially interesting. You know what the shield of faith is all about? The shield of faith needed something done to it every way, every day. The shield every day in the ancient Roman armor, they would, they would oil it because it was made of, of substances that would degrade and decay and, and, and not, not work properly if it didn't get that oil on there. What does oil represent in the Bible? We're talking about the Holy Spirit. So we need a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit every day as we seek God. How about the helmet of salvation? Where does salvation take place? What is it? It's the head, right? What's in there? The brain. We're talking about the mind. Salvation is the transforming our minds, the renewing of our minds. And so we, we, we pray on the, 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 the whole armor of God. How about the belt of truth? That would make a good name for a ministry, wouldn't it? The belt of truth. If you don't have the truth about God and the truth about God's feelings about you and God's victory that he's given you, if you don't have this walking relationship where you have this vivid awareness of the presence with Jesus, of Jesus as Enoch did, you know, the whole armor falls apart. Literally, in the Roman armor system, the belt was the part that held everything else together. The, the, the pieces, the shield, the breastplate, the sword hung on there, everything was hooked and linked in to, that, to, to the belt. The truth will set you free. This is why the belt of truth is so essential. There's your armor of God, a thoughtful hour in the word of God, claiming these promises. And, you know, after all of this good emotional healing stuff, how, how do I go forward? How does life look different now? Do I sit around and talk about my addiction all the time? No, don't, don't dwell on the addiction. Don't talk about it endlessly. Instead, you fill the mind and the life with other things. Think about this. If you're saying, if you're even saying this, I can stop doing this. What is the this you're thinking about right there, right? So you don't think about it. Don't talk about it. Don't say, don't think about sexual thoughts. <laughs> it's like, don't think about the elephant, right? No, don't even say, I'm going to, I'm going to beat this. No, d d ignore the this. Think about God. Think about other things. Fill your mind with scripture. Scripture memory. By the way, there's an excellent DVD series that anybody seeking to overcome needs to get. Actually, two of them put out by Chad and Fadia Cruiser and Anchor Point Films. The Overcoming Seminar and transformed brain, transformed life. These are two you need to view after you view a greater lust. And this will give you even more steps and tips for moving forward. One of those is Bible memorization. You're going to love the material on Bible memorization in that, in that seminar. But here you go. We're going to go now in a practical way to the place where we commonly sinned. And we're going to do something there. The next step here. Maybe it's the laptop, a certain place, and, and it could be a bunch of places, but go to that place and sanctify it with prayer. And the reason I suggest that you go to this and make this a place of prayer is for two reasons. Number one, because Satan occupies a certain territory. He claims certain territory, and literally a get behind me Satan right here will cause demons to flee from tempting you at this place. But a second more, more hard science reason is there's something that they say in neurology, which is neurons that fire together, wire together. So in other words, we have associations in our life. The most famous association is you got a smoker who's smoking a cigarette and drinking a cup of coffee, right? The two go together. Now, if he wants to quit smoking, he'd better also quit drinking coffee because if he tries to quit smoking and keeps drinking coffee, what is his brain going to tell him? Ooh, coffee is associated with cigarettes, right? And so they link together. The neurons fire together because they are wired together in your experience. So if instead of this place in your house being a place of lust and, 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 and these behaviors, if you turn that around now, now this is a, a, a house of prayer. This is a place of prayer in the house. This is my prayer closet. I'm going to spend time each day rewiring my brain. So now that spot is wired up with prayer instead of wired up with all of these other things. And if you do that enough, you remove that trigger from your life. Consider actually even just replacing the smartphone that you're using. Uh, just a new hardware device, a new laptop actually can go a long way to replacing these triggers and not having those neurons fire together anymore. I know it seems insignificant. It seems silly, but changing the physical environment Environment, even rearranging the furniture in your house. Anything can help like this. God says to you, behold, I will do a new thing. Forget the former things and the things of old. Don't think about them. But we first have to identify some of these triggers before we can get rid of them, right? So identifying triggers takes some time. You have to go through a process. Actually write down 
What was going through your head? What was happening in your day, thoughts and feelings before your last relapse happened? This is not going to be a habit we engage in daily. We're not going to constantly just talk about our struggles, but take one time to, exor- to go through this exercise and find, okay, what are the ways that I get tripped up most, most commonly? Because once you identify them, you're normally not thinking about them, right? You have to identify them. 90% of our thoughts and decisions are happening subconsciously in our day. So we've got to think, uh, take some time for reflection and think about it. Journal, find those patterns, and once we find them, we can find routes around them. We can remove these triggers from our life so that we don't have more temptation than we need. And, and, and also, you can come up with new rituals, new routines, new patterns in life to avoid those situations, to avoid those, those things that would happen in your life. Now, you might say, well, what is all this self-reflection stuff? Is this, is this needed? Listen to what Enoch did. It says, it says in, in Living the Life of Enoch, Many study books to perfect themselves in knowledge while they neglect to become acquainted with themselves. And this work, this work of becoming acquainted with themselves, will be perfected through the merits of Christ. And it requires much meditation and earnest prayer. So this is something we're taking to God. We're not just talking and thinking about ourselves. We're taking this to God in prayer and meditating upon these things and saying, God, Help me understand myself. Help me understand my pitfalls, my my stumbling blocks, the things that have tripped me up in the past. Help me understand those wounds that we talked about earlier. Understanding yourself is an important part of this process. And also, this is key. What sort of thoughts were there that opened up the door to you going down this road of, of lust? We fly through our day, right? We don't think enough about our own thoughts. Stop from time to time to think about your thoughts. Contemplation, self-reflection, these things are essential. But what, what you need to identify is the false thoughts and feelings in your day. If there were things that got you off track in your mood or got you stressed out, depressed, whatever, lost, and it culminated in this, there was a lie somewhere that got you on this road of self-destruction. A lie somewhere. We have so much distorted thinking in our, in our day. There's an excellent book called The Lost Art of Thinking by Neil Nedley. Get this book and read the first 10 chapters. You will learn about 10 ways that we think in a distorted manner. We don't think clearly and accurately and truthfully. We, our emotions, our feelings get us all out of whack in our lives and that leads to much, much trouble. But we can short circuit those triggers and those, the false thoughts by right thinking and new, new behavior. But again, here, I want to be clear on this. Don't just focus on the trigger. If I'm just talking about my triggers all the time, what am I doing again? I'm filling the mind with my pitfalls and my addiction. No, do this exercise once and then move forward. Behold, I will do a new thing, God says. And more new habits, more new routines, more new thoughts. The more new, the better. I am doing something new here, God says. You know, this action of of, of the brain to become addicted, this actually was a new thing at some point, right? And a lot of people think about addiction as unlearning the thing that I learned before. But addiction recovery is not just unlearning the thing that I learned before, the habit. Addiction recovery is learning something new entirely, replacing the old with something new, finding new habits to replace the old. The the, the new is more important. Finding the new is just as important as stopping the old. Because if I stop the old without replacing it with something new, the old will just come back in and, 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 and occupy me again. We read, for many, dealing with other causes is going to be important. It is a systematic impulse control problem for some people, not just a lust problem. If you're spending money, eating food, saying things you regret, just you have an impulse control problem, well, maybe lust is actually just a symptom of a deeper problem. So deal with all of that together as you're moving forward. Don't just deal with the pornography addiction, but deal with all of my issues with impulsive behavior. Also, maybe another thing is you're struggling with depression. There's some very good depression recovery material out there, also by Dr. Neil Nedley. Deal with the depression while you're dealing with pornography recovery. They need to go hand in hand. How about if stress is at the root of some of this? You need to learn how to deal with stress. I'll tell you, the stressors are going to happen in life. Life can be very stressful and irritating and difficult, and these things are going to happen. So people use pornography to reduce stress. They're not doing this consciously like, man, I'm stressed out, I'm going to do this, but it's an outlet, it's something that happens. We, if we learn how to deal with stress better, then we, can, then we can avoid that pitfall once again. So how do we reduce stress? 
Well, exercise, that's going to help enormously with reducing stress. Also, 70 to 80% of stress is actually rooted in just our perception of situations, not in the actual situations themselves. So we, we filter events through our thoughts. So what we need to do then is change the interpretation of the events. The Lost Art of Thinking, Neil Nedley's book, will do a great deal for you in helping you understand how to interpret events in life accurately instead of filtering them through our distorted perceptions and getting stressed out about events in life. Also, chances are you are magnifying things that you're stressed about. That's another form of distorted thinking. Plug for Lost Art of Thinking. Get that book. Read the first 10 chapters right away. Now we're going to have a new life. I want you to think about having a very detailed and deliberate schedule for each day. You know, interestingly, there's this King Jotham. He became mighty before the Lord. Why? Because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. Prepared his ways. So when you say, what are you going to do today? Have an organized and detailed plan of how you're going to take on life. How you're going to have something new, right? Behold, I will do something new. Well, what is that something? Let's talk about it. Let's organize it. Uh, one of the things, too, that you're going to need to think about is when we're, when we're getting rid of something from our lives, our thought lives, our actual behaviors, there was probably quite a bit of time that was occupied there, we've got to fill that time with other things. If we don't fill that time with other things, that void will suck the behavior right back in. So you have that schedule for each day. You see in Proverbs 16, verse 3, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. So I come before the Lord and I say, Lord, this is my, this is my plan for the day. Is this your will? And, and seek, just like Enoch did, is this the way of the Lord? Is this the way of the Lord? And plan it out. Have a schedule. Be deliberate. Be intentional. You read in Mind, Character, and Personality that irregular hours for eating and sleeping sap the brain forces. Session six, we're going to talk a lot about the issue of lifestyle and treating our body and our brain right because without a strong brain, we're going to really struggle here. And if we don't have a plan for our meals and sleep time, you just read. If you, don't have, if you have irregular hours for these things, it's going to sap the brain forces. We need a strong brain. And so when we focus on this new life, all the new things I'm doing, all the changes I'm making, all the new habits, new routines, new, 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 it will crowd out the old thought patterns and living patterns. And, and, and fill your life with a whole environment of positives. How about positive media, positive reading, positive social network? We want to do as much changing as we can. Do some spring cleaning in the house, reorganize the books on the shelf, whatever, just new positive things bringing into your life. Just fill the mind with a whole new thought life of interests, passions, and knowledge. This is the path to addiction recovery. How about reading? You know, your reading material. Did you know that if you just read 20 minutes per day, and I'm talking of some inspirational, you know, not some fiction, fantasy, nonsense, but true reading. If you spend 20 minutes a day contemplating these things, did you know that you will read 20 books on average? Just 20 minutes a day will get you through 20 books in a year. So, you know, I prefer to fill my mind with things auditorially. I listen to the Bible. I listen to books and, and, and sermons and other things on my, on my iPhone. And that's another way to do it, whether, whether you're reading or taking these things in. But we've got to fill the mind. New activities. How about new hobbies? Take a class. Plant a garden. Learn about things you didn't already know about. Learn a new language. Learn a new musical instrument. Work on a puzzle. Whatever. Just do something new. You're getting the picture here, right? Behold, I will do something new is what God God wants to do in your life. Now, the most important new thought, and we talked about this in session four, is the communion with God. The life of the soul depends upon habitual communion with God. If we miss out on part session four and we miss out on the Enoch life, you know, I can, I can start a garden and, and take a class and learn a language. That's not going to solve my problems. Those things are going to help a lot. But the most important new thought is filling the mind with thoughts of God. Listen to session four again and really fix your eyes on Jesus. And now the most important new thought, once again, we read in Living the Life of Enoch. If we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and names. Oh, I love this promise. He will so blend our hearts and mind into conformity to his will that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. 
Brothers and sisters, do you believe that that is true? Do you believe that can be actualized in your life for real? Where, where you're, you're so habituated to obeying God that your own impulse is to obedience to God. Where sin is hateful and distasteful to you. And I can say honestly, brothers and sisters, as God has taken me through this journey as a man, when, when an image pops up and I'm driving and I'm walking through the airport or whatever, there is a moment of, 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 of distaste. And yes, of course, these things are attracted, but it's like, no. It, it, there's, there's a firm resolve. It, and that's what God wants to do. I'm not there yet, but God wants to give us complete habitual obedience where we can say, the old has gone, the new has come, where we can say we've received the seal of God and we can say that we are ready for Christ to return. And he has promised that. That is a gift. That's not something that I have to stress out and accomplish. But sin will become hateful. And I'll tell you, when I see sexually alluring Im images, I, I get a little angry. I get a little, man, this is just wrong. Why? And that's what we need to have. And I want more of that. I'm not placing myself on a pedestal. That's Christ in me. The only, the only accomplishments that I've been, have, have grown in my life. But you look at yourself probably and you look back and hopefully you can see growth and you can say, praise God. This is his work. And, and you know what? Frankly, the closer we get to Christ, the more we see, oh, there's another corner of my own soul that needs addressing here. So we never get to the point now where we say, well, I'm doing pretty well spiritually. No, we humbly come before him every day and we say, I am spiritually poor. But God says to you, behold, I will do a new thing. And I'll save, I've saved the very, very, very best for last. The, the most important newness factor in our lives. God has an important role for you to play in his kingdom that maybe you have not discovered yet. What is the objective of your life? What is your life's purpose? What is the meaning and purpose that you wake up with every morning saying, God has a work for me to do? When you find that, a pure and holy passion, a obsession in life to do the work of God, and not in my own strength, not because I want to do it, because he's called me to it. This is what you find with Enoch and Elijah. Listen to this, Enoch and Elijah, both men were translated before seeing death, without seeing death. They became very different from the world. In their, act, in their plans and their objectives in life were also different. Isn't that interesting? Their objectives in life. Brothers and sisters, what are your objectives in life? If you were to have a life mission statement, what would it be? And are you living it out each day? Here I am, Lord, send me. Ought to be the plea of every person. Where will he send you? I don't know. What will he have you to do? I don't know. He's, he's uniquely gifted and created each individual with, with skills, interests, talents, passions, and, and ability to do something that no other person can do. And that's you, and you're important in his cause because he has chosen you for it. Seek God in this, and he will fulfill the desires of your heart. Both of us had careers and in order for our children we felt to be raised for the Lord, one of us would need to stay home. When Jesus came to this earth and he came riding in on a donkey into Jerusalem, announcing his kingdom, who was it that proclaimed him as the king? It was the children. It's saying what has been will be. Just as the children proclaimed the coming king, so also the children in the last days will have that final message in their possession.
start when they're really small. When our children were just babies, we would play them scripture song tapes. But we realize their minds are like sponges and they will soak up what comes their way. The parents who had success in raising spiritually strong young adults actually viewed it as their job. Not the church, not the pastor, not the church school. It was their job. If we can set aside a little bit of time every day for reading the Bible together, it will go a long way. All of these daily challenges of being a parent will finally come to this point where you see that the majesty of heaven is approved of your work. Not because you did everything perfectly, but because you walked with him. When you fell down, you got back up. Because you were willing to be different. Because you were willing to guard their hearts. Because you were willing to say, this is my number one job in life and I'm going to make sacrifices. Because you were willing to take the time to prepare family worships, to prepare Bible, Bible study with the children, to weave Jesus into their experience. You were willing to make all the sacrifices needed to disciple your children, moms and dads. Because permissive parents let their kids do pretty much what they want. They're not thinking about their kids' future. Parents who are too harsh, they are very demanding. They're thinking mostly of themselves and their own personal convenience, not the growth of their child. And so every Christian home should have rules. We should point out the way in unmistakable terms, because if we don't, if we have homes of no discipline and raise children who have no order, discipline, obedience, and submission to authority, then what we're giving them is a petting viper to cherish, and it'll bite them and everyone around and eternally lose their souls. So when, when you're dealing with them in their sin, you are teaching them more about God's grace and forgiveness and about the gospel than at any other time. What a wonderful opportunity. If you're beating your head against the wall over your child's behavior, we all struggle with our children's behaviors, okay? We all have moments of discouragement, even, even despair. Because I can press on with all of my strength and all of my strategies and all of my doing my best as a parent. But if I don't have the power of God, I got nothing. Meta Immersed, it's inducting people into the virtual plane of existence, combined with Zuckerberg's company, formerly known as Facebook, now called Meta. They renamed their company. That's how big and front and center this Metaverse concept is going to be. The Metaverse is not just a technology. It is the future world which we will all live in. That's what the World Economic Forum announced. Here you have the acceleration of digital transformation has enabled a new normal for education and work. The new normal, the new normal, the new normal. You remember hearing that in COVID dystopia. A new, a new normal for what? For education. Think about the true education implications of that. Everything going online, human contact fading away, not because of a pandemic and a disease. That was just preparatory to really what was coming. That was ushering this in. You see where this could be taking us. And where did it start? It started with this photo that was released by Facebook years ago. And it was foreshadowing what's coming with the metaverse. It's Mark Zuckerberg. And notice all of the regular commoners are plugged in and immersed into their virtual world. But who is the one remaining human, remaining bipedal, remaining walking above the others with a smile of satisfaction on his face? The Pope is big with the big tech people. Now guess who else is promoting this VR reality? None other than probably the most notorious occult practitioner in the world today, Marina Abramovich. No, it's the metaverse is going to be a counterfeit reality like the devil has never been able to invent. He wanted to be the creator. He wanted to be in the position of God. He couldn't do that. He can't do that. But now you have another place for people to escape from. And I know I'm repeating myself from media on the brain and the media mind, but that was all taking us somewhere. Total meta immersed. If human beings 
from driving to manual labor to immersing ourselves in the metaverse to having the education there and jobs there and AI taking over, hiring AI taking over all the physical labor, information labor, even writing, music, creativity, art, and things of that nature. It helps us understand why Harari keeps saying things like, what do we need so many humans for? Just as the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century created the urban working class, so the automation revolution of the 21st century might create the useless class. And then the big political and economic question of the 21st century will be what do we need humans for? Or at least, what do we need so many humans for? Do you have an answer in the book? Um, at present, the best guess we have is uh, keep them happy with drugs and computer games. Artificial intelligence warning, AI, capable of predicting and manipulating your future. That's where the control comes in. The internet knows you because of your data better than your spouse does, Scientific American. Because this is not just for selling us things. The technocracy will be able to utilize this data. Where is this taking us? You'll see how new faiths are actually emerging, new religions are emerging, secularism is fading, papacy and AI and literally new worldviews and religious viewpoints surrounding the rise of artificial intelligence are coming. We'll get into that and the literal worship of artificial intelligence, spiritual machines. What does former Google executive Ray Kurzweil mean when he talks about spiritual machines? We're going to understand the nature of free will and the great controversy and how artificial intelligence and algorithmic manipulation based upon data collection and surveillance will alter the course of human decision making. Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. In conversations, in our homes, biometric information on our bodies, even the emotion we display in our face. Don't look now why you should be worried about machines reading your emotions, The Guardian reported. So if, if we understand religion in general as a story about authority, then in the 21st century we will have a new dataist religion or a new algorithmic religion which will tell people the source of authority is algorithms, is big data algorithms. If you have a big question in life or a small question in life, the source of authority is the big data algorithms. Technocracy can transition now to rule by tech. Okay, Google, who is Joseph Smith? According to Wikipedia, Joseph Smith Jr. was an American religious leader and founder of Mormonism and the Latter-day Saint movement. Wow. Okay, now let's try Jesus. Okay, Google. Who is Jesus Christ? Here are some results from the web. Wow. JW.org to find out about Jesus. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, Alexa. Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is a fictional character 